I'm Robert Bean, and this is Focus, Purpose and Leadership. I decided to create this podcast because in my 40-year career in the advertising and brand strategy worlds, I've come to learn about the fundamental importance of clarity and purpose, or in my terms, the value of having a single organizing principle, one that influences a business's culture, its products and services, and its reputation. In this series, I'll be chatting with CEOs and leaders who have put it into practice whilst developing their own successful businesses. In this episode, I talk to Kevin Reeves, an ex-Special Forces soldier who served all over the world. Abandoned by his parents and heading for a life of drugs and crime, he found the military and, in particular, Who Dares Wins. He talks about this with passion and vigour and brings it to life as a real-life single organising principle. Now settled back into civvy life, he runs several international businesses in the food and personal care sectors. As I'm sure you'll agree with me, he's one of those characters who's mad, bad and a little dangerous to know. Kev, thanks for coming and doing this. I'm so pleased to have you here because God knows we could take hours, I think, talking about your life alone. But I'm going to try and restrict this to pressing you on my favourite topic, which is single organising principles, what I do for a living. And in particular, the SAS one of Who Dares Wins. Uh, Very interested to know how that applies to serving soldiers, how it's trained, how it's maintained, and all that. But perhaps we can get to that and just start in a good place to start, which is the start, and a bit about your background. Good Lancastrian boy. Ooh, what a beautiful thing. Well, Good can, Lancastrian boy. Can I, I like that very much. Can I ask you then, yeah. do you agree with me, or what's generally felt to be the case, that you can tell a Yorkshireman, but you can't tell a Yorkshireman anything? I think that's probably a good soundbite. Yeah. Yeah. Although there's plenty of places worse than Yorkshire. So <laughs> being a good northerner first and a Lancastrian second, okay. I will have to politely um, sort of side, sidestep that okay. story. All right. well, yeah. uh, so w- there, there we are. And now it's not a secret because much has been written about you, your life. But just to move things along, it was a very difficult start, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was. And... Um, so my my journey began in Blackpool, which at the time was the poorest town in England, statistically. And I ended up in children's homes. My dad was a heroin addict and he abandoned us quite soon. My mum was very young. She was only 17. And my granddad, who had survived the Holocaust by escaping um, Italy as a, a Jew, uh, had landed in Lytham St. Anne's and he decided to set up uh, with a suitcase full of cash and probably some plundered jewels, hopefully, <laughs> a um, a little nursing home. And so that's where I grew up with my mum in a nursing home, which had about nine or ten decrepit old people who, back then, I don't think it was a f- particularly romantic place to grow old and die. But I enjoyed it because I was tearing around these sort of three-floored building. Um, exploring and running around on the beach all day. Anyway, after that, sadly, my mum met another dude who was just appalling and he became my stepdad. They had more children and it quickly fell into disrepair. We fled to Preston and I went straight to children's homes. So then um, things didn't go well for me, really. Um, I had a terrible time at school, ended up getting into a lot of trouble was taken out of mainstream education and went to an amazing place called Bickerstaff House, which is an adolescent psychiatric unit, um, <laughs> which is where they aptly pointed out that I might have some issues. Brilliantly, uh, I was then given no treatment for it. So I ended up in the army at 16. And when I went to the army careers office and said, hey, guys, I'd like to join the army. And they took one look at my runtish little frame, bespeckled and forlorn and said, "Um, you might need to go away and put some meat on. So I duly did that, came back and did the various little tick tests to join Her Majesty's Armed Forces. And they told me I was smart enough to do any non-commissioned job in the British Army. And so I wanted to join the Royal Engineers as a surveyor engineer because apparently you'd be a staff sergeant within four years. 
So that was the course that I started and off I went to Chepstow to the uh, Beachley Old Boys Academy uh, at 16 years of age in Wales to become a soldier. And for those of us who don't know the military all that well, the Royal Engineers sort of remit is what exactly? The Royal Engineers carry out engineering tasks, bridge building, route denial, um, watermanship, explosives and demolitions, Minefield preparation, minefield clearance, you know. <laughs> good training, good training for what, what happened All later. stuff I learnt in Blackpool um, <laughs> and all they did was take advice from me yeah. and to perfect their skills. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I read somewhere that you said that you struggled in the army because of the discipline, but when you were happiest was when they let you or encouraged you to think. Correct. I hated the army. I thought it was an insidious institution that fundamentally made me bereft of, of, of creativity. I mean, that's not the case. The military is a wonderful functioning organisation that has remarkably creative people within it. And it's, it's often poorly explained. But for me at that time, discipline was something that having grown up in children's homes and an adolescent psychiatric unit, the last thing I needed was to be told what to do again. And I naturally push back against discipline anyway, because I'm just a pretty insubordinate little sod. So um, no shock, I came into conflict almost immediately. (laughs) So there you do six years of the engineers and you leave then the army, do you? Yeah, so I then, um, I did. I, I, I served in, in the engineers all over the world. You know, I did lots of tours of um, Bosnia and Kosovo um, and various other places. And I then left because I'd applied to become an army helicopter pilot. And I'd wanted very much to become a commercial pilot. And they wouldn't let me because I had a number of issues with my senior chain of command. So I left to become a helicopter pilot which is what I duly did. I had money saved and I applied to Bristow's for a scholarship and I went and became a commercial helicopter pilot. And when I'd finished that and I started flying people around as a glorified taxi service, I quickly realised I didn't want to be a helicopter pilot anymore. And there was two pathways that I'd always wanted in the army. One was to go special forces and one was to become a helicopter pilot. And now I had this helicopter pilot, I suppose, licence I felt that I'd completed it. So then I wanted to join the SAS. And so the route then to join Special Forces was to firstly go back in via uh, London Division into 2-1 SAS, which is the Reserve Special Forces Unit, spend 12 months doing selection with them, and then cross over to 2-2 SAS at Hereford by doing the jungle phase of selection and spending another six months training. And that process, if you like, was going to take me the best part of two years. But knowing what I knew from being out of the military and knowing how much I felt I needed that in my life now that I'd got this helicopter issue out of the way. So by the spring of 2000, I was a fully paid up member of the SAS. Okay, so go back a step then. Introduce Who Dares Wins. What was your first introduction to that beyond having heard it said wherever but in in practice well it's very interesting because i was 16 and i was looking at an army recruitment poster and on there was this um sort of damocles or excalibur or the 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 dagger in either wings or flames because there are many determinations of actually what the cat badge means and then underneath was who dares wins um which I have on my arm in French. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the sensations you get from that, because you'd heard it from the Daring Do books of reading comics as a boy, is that to dare all and to risk all for a single purpose and for a single mission has a very romantic and a very sort of compelling, drawing feeling to it. Um, and so immediately I thought, that's amazing, what's that? Not knowing who the SAS were, not knowing anything about them, not even beginning to think that that was an elite regiment in the British Army that had founded special forces or the modern day special forces. So that was you at 16 saying 16 that. years at, of age, at, yeah. At 20... The first time I saw Who Dares Wins. And I'd, I'd thought about this because I knew you'd ask me, when was I first aware of Who mm. Dares Wins? And it was then at 16. So what happens at the age of 22, 3, when you're doing it for real then? 
Well, where... then it didn't. It didn't. It didn't occur to me again. And this was the second time. Was when I was on the parade square at Pontralis in Hereford uh, for the the badging ceremony, and me and another eight blokes are stood there, and the commanding officer steps forward and he hands me a sand-coloured beret with a sewn badge, and that's when you get this euphoric, overwhelming sensation. It just hits you. Oh my God. Uh, um, yeah, I bet that's I've just what been you said. Yeah. I've just yeah. been given the cat badge of a regiment that has the highest reputation of itself in the world. In the world. Yeah. In the world yeah. as being the single strike unit that all countries wish they had and fear. And now in this rites of passage, I've been handed that very cat badge by the commanding officer. Uh, and on there, sure enough, it says, who dares wins? And so that was really the only time it truly, you know, meant an immense, um, I suppose, overwhelming feeling. Can I just say as an aside, picking up on what you just said, that in these difficult and awkward times about the nation trying to re-identify itself, institutions like the SAS, perhaps the SIS as well, and there aren't many, are really the things that I at least cling on to as being, oh my God, this country still has so much to offer. And I think we forget them too easily and too often. I'm sure you agree. I do. I also think that on balance, uh, there's lots of other institutions which are just as wonderful. I mean, we shouldn't just focus on, on the elite ones. But one of the things that the SAS and indeed SIS, and that's a very good um, example as well, have done is create the mystique and delusion that often is the psychological warfare prior to actually any surgical strike action occurring. So long before special forces assets hit the ground and start blowing your doors and windows in, um, the psychological euphoria that comes with the knowledge that the men in black may visit you and visit violence upon you um, is, is normally enough. And, and that illusion is linked also to this notion that we have hundreds of these guys and we don't. We have a very small amount of these men and at any one time there are only 80 on rotational standby. The rest are deployed all over the world in one and two man tasks or whole squadron tasks depending on the activity necessary. And of course they're highly intelligent, extremely adaptable human beings. But we haven't got that many. And so one of the tricks is to make you feel the, the apparition that we're bigger. That's interesting. And much more powerful by default. That's very interesting. I mean, in brand terms, you know. Exactly. I, I and SIS do that. exactly the yeah, same. Yeah. Now, they are both excellent examples of calculated bigging up, in it, but for positive reasons. Right, back to the records then. So there we are. The, 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 the cap with badge is bestowed on you. And at that moment, was it those words then, who dares wins, as you're receiving that sand-coloured cap that kind of made you feel the way you did? Or was it just the ov overwhelming sensation of Yeah, the it, was, it was indeed all that. The sand berry, the badge, the who dares wins, the, the, the cap badge. But I think... One of the, the amazing things is that, you know, believe it or not, during the selection process, you sit down and are schooled on regimental history and you are taught some of the roles and rolling of special forces and what United Kingdom Special Forces is tasked with doing. And it's a pretty healthy long list. And the ethos of special forces is held in in the most highest regard mm. as opposed to the motto. So the motto or the unifying principle which everybody in the special forces takes for granted who dares wins that i am duty bound to dare all for all in the execution of my duty um it, that's taken for granted because everybody just has it in their in their psyche but the bit that they drill into you is is the ethos and 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 they are the unrelenting pursuit of excellence classlessness where we are all equal humility and humor uh, and cheerfulness in adversity so these are the things which are really, really drilled into you that you live and die by. You know? Yeah, they are what a, a normal business might call their values, That's aren't right. they? Mission, vision, uh, values. Yeah. And the, well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, that's right. This, when you say drilled into you, I mean, is it? It's drilled into you in a kind of formal way, is it, or is it just? That's what's expected and you get picked up when it doesn't happen. Do you see the distinction? Yes, it, it is drilled into you, but 
I think the longer something's been going, when you know that historically there have been so many examples where Britain and the world has looked to the SAS for its assistance, hostage rescues are always the ones that get mm. the most attention from, mm. you know, um, Operation Nimrod to Operation Barass, the reigning embassy siege, Sierra Leone. There were countless more in Iraq. And without without saying anything that hasn't been published, during Iraq and Afghanistan, SAS soldiers were doing the equivalent of the Iranian embassy siege every day. Mm. Every day. Every single day yeah, in back-to-back kinetic operations. Um, and that's why America only chooses us as their tier one partner and why the only tier one units in the world are Special Forces Delta and the SAS. And the reputational risk of not performing to the highest standard within that organization, such of your forefathers and those that have borne that cat badge before you, is so fearful inside you that you are the one guy who cocks it up for your regiment that people don't. Because that fundamental principle holds true. It is the absolute ramrod backbone of that process, structure and formation. So how do you define that then? Can you do that in a short phrase or sentence, what you've just talked about? Yeah, corps d'esprit. You feel so... It's not even about queen and country. I'm not even a monarchist. I'm more of a republican than anything else. You know, I don't see the point of bowing to deities, gods and kings. But I do believe in my regiment and I would I would happily die for it. Mm. I would. And I'm not even religious mm. Mm. because I believe so much in the cause that uh, and it's not even some sort of ego trip of the white knights that hold the final guard. You know, I'd, although that's also true, um, w- they are the last and first line of defense and the reputation is 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 for on the battlefield. No, I, I've no doubt about that. I mean, the intensity of those situations will bind you to each other like no other situation can. I, I've no doubt, never having been in one like that, but it, you know, us mortals can sort of understand that because we've all been in one situation or another. But that is really twin turbo intense. I, I get that. But, but just to be a bit provocative, are you suggesting that the line who dares wins is a sort of um, slightly flaccid, passive, overarching thing that just sits there under which all the real stuff sits, the values, this esprit de corps and all the rest of it. Yeah. No, I am, and I think you've said it far and more eloquently and better than I could. Um, I genuinely do, and I think everybody kind of feels the same way. And I don't know whether you've got this historical fatigue where you're just so used to it that to you, you see this every day. Um, I mean, Who Dares Wins is, it says what it says on the tin, doesn't it? It's really, really, really clear. Yeah. Um, that, that it, so in, in operational planning, you have a thing called combat estimation. Everything has to have a combat estimation. You have to assess what the risk is. You know, people think that this is all about blowing in the door and kick. It's not. The, the clinical rehearsal, the component of the strategy, the deliberate action has to go through a process of tests which are relentless and complete and complex. And so to win that test before men step foot into a hornet's nest of violence and initiate death on a wholesale basis, there is a huge amount of elaborate and complex planning. And so the who dares wins bit is relevant because you still have to step into that hornet's nest, raise a weapon and engage the enemy. But before that happens, there's just a lot of practice, preparation and pause uh, you know, prior planning and preparation. Yes. Um, yeah. Then there is the dare all for all, yeah. and then the shock and awe. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean you've you've answered my next question actually, which is the extent to which literally that phrase "Who dares wins" applies in the planning. So. I mean, the point you're making... It's an organising principle. Yeah, right, exactly. It's, it's, yeah, actually, yeah. it's actually in the planning and preparation. So, so when you're doing the planning then, which, as you say, is, is meticulous and fastidious, as it absolutely has to be, there's a lot at stake, is a deliberate part of the plan itself to be daring? I mean, uh, f- that feels like a dumb question. Yes, actually, yeah. and that comes from the senior NCOs within the teams. So they are the combat experienced... And this is a principle of structure of the infantrymen throughout the British Army. And it comes from the way in which officers are taught by senior NCOs. And the cycle is, the process is cyclic. So senior NCOs are taught by officers. Officers are taught by senior NCOs. And so the soldiers that are commanding the troops, 
before they get off a helicopter are responsible to get the relevant levels of aggression and uh, chemicals and juices flowing. And that's when absolutely, you know, it's relevant to remind us of what and who we are. And, the, uh, and does that happen? I mean, f- for instance, when you've been in a Chinook about to land or that moment where you're about to do what you're about to do, has anyone ever said those words, who dares wins? Or, or, or is it facetious in that situation no, to not, use it, language like it, that? It, it, it's not facetious. And yes, it's been said many times throughout history. At the moment at of the execution. Moment, at the moment of start line or at the moment of go, go, go. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then then when it's all happened. Also, my favourite, let's go bitches. <laughs> well, that's a more colloquial version of the I same always thing. think, go, 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 let's go bitches. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a possibly slightly less poncy version of the same thing. <sighs> then you do it. You step across the threshold and you're in what... More often than not, it's minutes rather. Well, that can be hours, obviously. But during that time, I mean, almost literally when the bullets are flying, mm-hmm. it, have you ever in your mind or heard any one of your colleagues yeah. refer back to those words again and gone? Yeah, well, I've got a very funny story, actually. I was in Sierra Leone quite a long period of time after the war. And I was in a vehicle heading way east towards the Liberian border, the, the Mano River. And I had the vice president of Sierra Leone's bodyguard in the front seat of the opposite to the passenger seat. And he had a, an Uzi 9 millimeter, which I'd had my eye on because it looked rusty as, you know, and, and clearly had not been cleaned in a good while. And I'd been giving this guy a load of crap because he was wearing a maroon beret which they, for some reason, issued all the Sierra Leonean bodyguard protection team. Anyway, unfortunately, he let he let the gun go off and shot me through the forearm. And I remember the bullet going into my forearm and feeling like a hammer had just hit me across my elbow. And I screamed really loudly. It was, it was an exceptional whine. <laughs> and within about five seconds, I immediately got a carabiner out improvised a tourniquet with a loop line clipped my hand to the the handle that's in the in, in the jeep yeah the above car, above yeah. above the door frame and gave myself first aid and directed them to turn around and take me to the indian hospital and he was obviously ibi his name was and ibi was really worried and he kept asking me excuse me sir are you okay are you okay are you okay and i said yeah baby who dares wins and i think for me that was one of those times where it's a bit like, yeah, OK, mommy, can I have my teddy bear? I took comfort in those words because I was concerned I might bleed out because even though this was in between my ulna and my radius and was definitely not going to damage any arteries, I was bleeding quite a bit and I was feeling a little bit nauseous and a little bit sick and a little bit weak and a little bit babyish because, you know, shit, I've just been shot and there aren't any decent hospitals here. But for me, I did get some comfort from that. Mm. The who dares wins, you know, yeah, motto. Yeah, yeah. No, and it, no, it gave me some yeah. solace. You know, yeah. chin up, Kev, yeah. bite down. Stop moaning about this. This is what you signed You're up in for. control. Yeah. You're in control. You've stemmed the bleeding. You've arrested the bleeding. You've got a tourniquet on. All right, your fingers are going blue. It hurts like hell, but you'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. No, um, no great. It's a, it's so I did. I have taken some solace from, yeah. it, from it myself. Can I press you on one further thing on this line of questioning then, Kev? When you've been in the jaws of the hellfire and you need to make a decision, go left, go right, for instance, Mm. has it come to bear in a situation like that as well, where you're not sure left or right, but you've decided on one or the other because who dares wins? On balance, there have been situations because I've both working for the Foreign Office and within United Kingdom Special Forces, I've been in lots of challenging and complex places. And they're, uh, you know, from West Africa to Afghanistan to and, and, and. And and of course, you come across difficult and very challenging scenarios almost daily, either by people, place or purpose. And, um, you know, place are navigable because jungles, deserts, all have process to follow. But people present, obviously, the most complicated of all because mm. you dev- you, they can be very it's unpredictable. unpredictable yeah. And there have been quite a lot of situations where, on balance, trying to be as pragmatic and as safe as possible in the perception of risk, I've had to just basically think to myself, well, you know what? 
let's go for it. Mm. So whilst I won't repeat to myself who dares wins, I will apply that logic. That there is on an, the balance, you've got to take the risk. Yes, yeah. but I mean, there's an interesting juxtaposition there, isn't there? Uh, on the one hand, risk minimization has to be one of the guiding forces because you've got a job to do and you need to get through the other side. And on the other hand, there is this sort of, you know, call for risk. But may, maybe, I d maybe I should explain. So actually, what I will add is that when I drive in a car, I don't have iPads on the floor, phones hanging around. It's a clean desk operation. My kids, when they get in the car, there's a trauma pack in the back. They're at most risk when they're in a vehicle. They're not at risk at home because of the way in which the perception of risk and operational risk is perceived. So when we're on operations, often the, the journey from and to is the most difficult, not just because of IEDs or being attacked and ambushed, but because of road traffic collision. So I perceive risk in very different ways to normal people. Mm. I'm appalled at how people drive and the shit they have in their car. Mm. But when it comes to getting out of that car and overwhelming somebody who is road raging for no reason at me, which I've had to do in the past and wish I hadn't, I'll do it. Even though I know that socially, morally, ethically, that's probably not the best for society. But only at that moment when there is no other alternative. But in the build up phases of stuff, I think I take more care than dare and more care than dare in almost 99% of scenarios. But when it comes to dare over care, by God, stand by, because the envelope has just opened that's it. Yeah, and we right. are going yeah. all out. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I think that's a really clear and helpful distinction and actually straightens out what appears to be a contradiction. The risk minimization is all up until the point. It's 99% yeah, exactly. planning, preparation yeah. and care, 1% dare, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Because the mindlessness perception is that it's just all about overloading violence, more guns, more helicopters, blowing everything. It doesn't work that way. It's simply not the case. No, no, no. Going I, and finding a hard target a complicated scenario inside a built-up urban area, pulling out one bad guy and not his family and getting him out of a place that has no police or no army and no civil society. Can you think of more complex things? It's not a computer game. Mm, mm. You can't just shoot everybody, mm. contrary to the public perception, unfortunately, that mm. that's what happens. It's just simply not true. Mm, mm, mm. You mentioned their speed, aggression, surprise. And yeah, it, and you, it that's sound, the joke term for SAS. Well, I was going to ask, yeah. is it? Yeah. It's an, it, it, yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. But it's not that much of a joke because it is pretty much an MO, I would Except think, when I was it? in 2-1 SAS, it was SAS Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> but the, the, the internal, um, the, 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 the speed, aggression, surprise. Yeah. And the other one you mentioned there was care and dare. And, and from the outside, I think... We see the SAS as, of course, being barnstorming, balaclava, in all that stuff. But there is actually a very deep, profound, intimate, caring, soft, gentle side to it too, isn't there? Absolutely. We have to deconflict targets. Um, the support and influence component of that is such that we have to be absolutely clear. When we pull the trigger, it's got to be the bad guy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, look. Ultimately, it's no secret um, that it's all over the internet. Um, on the London Bridge, the SAS were deployed. There was two uh, Dauphin Special Forces helicopters. A couple of my good mates were deployed onto that bridge, because at the time the police thought there was two lone nasties roaming the streets, hacking everybody to pieces. The amazing thing about this country is that it was a normal police patrolling armed response vehicle with police, three police officers and an X-5 that interdicted those targets and shot them dead. The SAS were on their way, but they weren't needed. When the SAS are deployed on our streets, it isn't good because they're going to hunt you and you're going to die. We're not going to ask questions. They're all just going to get drilled. And they're there. If they have to hunt a series of lone killers, that, then I'm delighted that they're going to be deployed by helicopter because they will be relentless. They'll be fitter and way more committed to task and will not hesitate to kill, unlike maybe some police officers. But what that process on London Bridge showed me was that our interdiction of targets and our process of response was fantastic. Those police officers, I, I saw the video of those three police officers. I saw the body cams. They were really scared, those coppers, mm. and they were all over the place with their guns, but they absolutely did their job beautifully. Nailed and They killed them, them both and mm. nailed them. Mm. By the time the SAS got there, it was all over. Mm. It was tea time. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so not that they were quick. They weren't quick to deploy. They were. They were there in seconds. Mm. You know, the SAS were there in, I think, four minutes mm. of, the, of, of the balloon going up. 
but they weren't needed. And mm. that's amazing. It shows me my civil society is more important. Mm. I don't want SAS running Rome no, in the streets. No, and it, that, it, that it works. I, I meant care in a more personal way. Um, you know, Ant and the others, for instance, which is probably the, 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 the biggest window into the SAS that people see. Yeah, there's all the ferocity and all that, but there is a, a, a deeply and profoundly caring bit about it as well. Lots of arms round shoulders, lots of concern about mental states, lots of propping people up and support. Is, is that uh, internally, or do you mean as one yeah, of our roles? Yeah, internally. No, internally. Well, that's also one of the roles: supporting and influencing. Um, you know, major battle space operations is is also relevant. That we work with indigenous rebel armies. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, I spent the best part of 10 years doing that very thing, mm. you know, propping up, uh, not an insurgency, but former fighters and teaching them to be farmers mm. so that they'd put down their tools of war and start and a business some, and building well, respect and building trust. We'll, so, we'll come back to that uh, uh, from, you know, weapons to farm tools. Um, I, I want to ask you another question uh, 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 about the training and the behaviours and it's the distinction between them teaching you lead good leadership and good followership and the extent to which that is formally recognised or are you going to tell me that every individual is as good a leader as they are a follower? No, that's a very, very good question and I tell you why because, you know, we get from Alex Ferguson to the heads of corporates invited to come and talk about leadership and they want to take lessons from us. Running the SAS is like running 200 premiership footballers. Mm. They're all elite operators, mm. athletes and super smart know-it-alls. Mm. And every one of them is an arsehole <laughs> because they've all got egos the size of a planet <laughs> and they all think they can do it better. How do you unify that team? <laughs> and they I can mean, get cross. Right. Can you imagine for the commanding team how they've got to organise that lot? Mm. You know, and keep everything super secret. Mm, mm. Um, So um, one of the ways that they do that is by making sure you can do both. And they do this through the following selection aptitude phase one. This is no secret. It's all in the public domain. Disclosure cell (laughs) is um, we go to Wales and we march every day alone for a month through the night, through the day, carrying increasingly heavy loads over very long distances. It's a lone ranger process. Can you follow and do, read a map, do as you're told when it's freezing cold or really hot? And of course, very recently, three of three died on that process in Wales. Mm. And so that's the individual stuff. And then they throw you in teams in the jungle where you have to come together, follow direction and also take your turn at becoming the leader. And so individuality and working in very small teams and also working as larger teams, as well as integrating into someone else's team. So being dropped in as the sheepdog, not the wolf, not the sheep, but the sheepdog and the shepherd to manage the wolves and also manage the sheep is the third most important part to being a follower, but also being a leader. But what you're saying, I think, is that in every single instance, there is a thousand percent clarity of my purpose and my role here. Always. Wh- wh- wherever I am. Always. In the, yeah. Always. The communication or chain of command, command and coordination and control is so well organized. It, 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 is, it is really, really, really good. So there is no way you can't fully execute your task. You know exactly what your limit of exploitation is. You know what your parameters are, your mandate and what you can and can't do. And you also have a very deliberate plan of extraction and escape if there's a problem. And do you have absolutely unwavering, unshakable belief and faith in your buddies, some of whom are leading the operation and it's getting sticky and you might not want to be led in a certain way but you just go with it because there's an order and a structure well absolutely i mean i'm i i i have and never was or will be a leader in special forces i didn't hang around long enough and probably would have been appalling at it anyway but those that do lead and those that do have command are exceptional at it and i have absolutely no doubt in my mind that every one of us and them would follow each other because we all have the same training yeah. and the same baseline 
of ability. Yeah. And because the baseline of ability bar is so high, <laughs> you, you, you know that the man left and right of you, fore and aft, has the skill set and won't yeah. leave you. Yeah. The, 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 I, I I've come across cowards in the army, just not there. Mm. Everyone's up for a, a proper proper dance. Now, what, what was behind that question, I think, was I'm trying to equate this with boards of businesses, for example, and how rare it is, at least in my experience, that I come across a board where looking left and right to my fellow Because there's no unifying baseline of standard for which they all had to join. Exactly. It, they didn't all have to row for Cambridge and get a first in PPE. Yeah. If you built a board where every man and woman had got a first in PPE, and had read classics and had to row for the team or play it, get their cap at rugby or something, yeah. physical and mental tests and academic tests were all met, then you would get more a, of that. You'd, yeah. get, you'd yeah. get more of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, isn't it? How business generally and by comparison is, is relatively less, well, clearly less disciplined. Of course, not everyone can be an SAS soldier. That wasn't the point. But it is more about the extent to which businesses are putting in this level of their own value systems and their own standards and criteria. I just want to move on then. You served your time and left the, the military altogether, I think, and went strangely into farming. Yeah. How... <laughs> Tell us about that. How did that come about? Well, I'd been working for the Foreign Office in Africa um, in post-conflict stabilisation, um, which I did when I left the army. And that was essentially stopping rebel soldiers from kicking the crap out of each other by giving them a purpose uh, and giving them an income and giving them an op entrepreneurial opportun opportunity. And in all cases of poverty, and it doesn't matter if you come from Blackpool or uh, Mogadishu or um, Freetown, the principles are the same. If you have nothing to look forward or go to and you're only thinking of tomorrow, all you have to do is give them a machete, an AK-47 or a knife and guess what will happen. Mm -hmm. And so these are breeding grounds for fundamentalism and they're breeding grounds for extremism. Uh, whether it's right-wing neocon or whether it's left-wing um, sort of Marxism. Ultimately, whether you're religiously motivated or you're not, it comes back to the, singularity, the same singularity. You'll go and fight for Al-Shabaab or Al-Qaeda, or you will go and stab someone to death in London. Simples. So in Africa, we came up with a number of complex but really well-thought-out agricultural opportunities that um, started with um, growing organic, fair-traded palm oil, um, the good palm oil, not the stuff in Indonesia and Malaysia, no deforestation, uh, coconuts, pineapples and a number of other crops. And very quickly, we had hundreds and hundreds of men that wanted to come and do this. But for whatever reason, the British and American governments, uh, and this was on a particularly complex area of West Africa, because after 9-11, the British and American governments were convinced Al Qaeda was going to push down to the west and south from the north as we flush them through and that they would take hold in these deep jungles and actually what happened was Ebola came but nonetheless they were very concerned and so we went and set these training camps up to teach these farmers to stop them if Al-Qaeda came and they did if they came to try and recruit they'd meet a bunch of young black men who said kiss my ass I've got a job and that's precisely what happened. And so, although Boko Haram and Al Shabab took some hold in various parts, and we had prob we have problems in Mali and Nigeria and the like, it's very different. Liberia, Sierra Leone, and that Western Belt stayed fundamentalist free, and it was very well done. But this was the Foreign Office. This was, yeah. I mean, this was the stuff I was doing. Foreign Office, okay. Maybe it was the military, maybe a bit of Foreign Office. Doesn't matter, but Foreign but that's Office what I was, backed, yeah, part right. of a strategy. But then what happened, ultimately, they pulled out. The Yanks and the Brits said, we're not going to fund this anymore. It's no longer, job done. I'm like, well, hang on a minute, who's going to employ these people? I've got 900 staff. So that's when I went to um, the city of London and I was introduced to a wonderful Indian son of a billionaire called Rangad Paul and he became my business partner. And uh, tragically, Angad's now dead. Um, but Angad was a very wealthy man and he gave me enough money to privatise the project because he believed in it. And um, I ended up earning 10% and he earned 90%. And we did it together. And that project today, although it's changed hands a number of times, um, is still running and still operational. 
And because of other things that I've done and we sold that and I made some money, I then could put it into another project and grow it. Um, between all of our things, we're the largest employer in Sierra Leone. Amazing. And we have 10,000 farmers. Amazing. And it's now the largest cooperative of organic palm oil, fairly traded organic palm oil in the world. Not bad for a skelly that yeah. was running around Preston, yeah. substance abuse. Well, I've been very lucky. A, yeah. I, I've been very, very lucky um, in the, you know, I've met some amazing people who've given me opportunity um, and given me the chance to be able to, to do that. Um, but it's been a journey. <laughs> it certainly has been a journey. It's and and a journey. you know, I've said to you very often in the past that I think the whole thing should be written up as at very least a book, a film, all the rest of it. Because it is an amazing journey from wow. those awful early days to here. And, and you're still so youthful. Kevin, I can't thank you enough. Um, not least in a somewhat myopic way. But I think the way you articulate how Who Dares Wins operates as a single organizing principle is really fantastic example of it at work in a non-commercial environment and hopefully it might help people listening to this and beyond understand the value importance of such things as single organizing principles and and encourage them to think about their own so I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful and as ever thoroughly enjoy our chats you're very welcome and thank you for having me and thank you for um letting me have this discussion more soon thanks again kevin please do subscribe to the podcast in your usual podcast app to get new episodes when they're released if you have any comments or questions don't hesitate to get in touch with me it's robert at robertbeanbranding.com thanks for listening